welcome to the annual DEF CON convention. This meeting was held in exciting Las Vegas, Nevada from July 9th through the 11th, 1999. This is video tape number 5, Freaking and PBX Tricks. about doing scans and checking scans and break-ins. This is meant as to take you from the beginning through moderate levels so you understand what we're talking about. Without further ado, um, here's Ghost. He's going to lecture about uh, phone freaking. Well, I don't have any fancy PowerPoint presentations or anything like that because I'm a very serious procrastinist, so I'm just going to ramble on. Um, well, to start off towards the beginning, or uh, was in the middle to late 80s, um, AT&T got broke up into Arbox, Regional Bell Operating Companies. Um, basically, their local dial town, they own all the facilities, copper, things like that. Um, about two years, well, actually it's been about five years, um, Local service could be provided by anybody, and those were CLEX, competitive local exchange car carriers. Um, basically, CLEX are a little easier to get to, I think, for freaking. Um, they borrow all their facilities from an Arbok, or they lease their own, or they run their own. Um, I work for a CLEC. I'm not going to give you a name because I don't want to get in trouble. <laughs> but um, we, as a CLEC, use the 5ESS switch, Lucent. It's a nice, nice piece of gear. Um, most CLECs use the Nortel DFMS 250, which is originally used for long distance carrier, but it's been upgraded for local. Um, I was going to have manuals to give out, but once again, procrastination. Um, starting off with the basics, um, in telco terms, you have what's known as a DS0, which is your everyday average phone line. Um, that's DS0. If you go up one step, you have a DS1, also referred to as a T1. It's 24 channels, which is 24 DS0s. If you go up one more step, you have a DS3, which is 28 T1s, and I believe it's 684 regular lines, and that can be run over fiber or coax. And the next step up would be an OC1, which is optical carrier one. It's one DS3 being transported over um, single mode fiber. Um, next step up is an OC3, three, S, three DS3s, OC12, OC48, OC192. Um, recently, there has been an addition of dense wave division multiplexing, which is basically running the lasers for fiber through a prism, breaking it into different wavelengths so you can run multiple optical gear over the same piece of single mode fiber. Um, okay. In most central offices, you'll have a switch, which is 5ESS the majority of the time if it's an RBOC, or a DFMS 250 if it's a CLEC. Um, you'll also have some sort of digital cross connect system to do your cross connects inside the CO. Um, between COs, they use what is known as A-Links, which uses the SS7 protocol. SS7 is essentially the um, it's essentially the the commands to initiate a phone call. Basically, one switch sends the information to the switch of the number that you're calling. Says. We're calling this number, is it busy, whatever, is it open, and then it sends the information back. The specifications on the SS7, I believe it can carry the control information for 
one SS7 link, which is a DS0, can carry 1,275 actual phone call information for it. Um, I haven't done much research on that. I'm sure there's probably some way to manipulate it. Um, moving on to equipment and techniques for freaking. Um, red boxing doesn't really work anymore unless you're in some rural backcountry that has um, a older switch. Um, basically, the essential tools are a B-box key, and a B-box is those boxes you see on the side of the road, green. Normal B-box will carry about 1,500 lines. Um, B-box key, pin it on those pliers works too. And a butt set or a beige box. I use a butt set. Beige boxes are easy enough. Um, Basically, the cabling system for the B boxes run in pairs of 25, color coded, going through color codes. And once you get past 25, it just duplicates. But you have binders around it, so you know which one you're dealing with. Um, there are certain numbers known as diverters or um, I can't think of any other term for it but basically what it is is it's a number that you dial that asks you for a access code and once you enter the access code you get dial tone again and basically what they're used for is say a lineman was used was at a B box clipped onto your line and needed to make a long distance phone, a long distance call. He'd call this diverter, get dial tone, and dial out from there. So it wouldn't show up on your bill. I've found that there's usually three to four in every area code. So they're pretty easy to find. Uh, getting the code, sometimes you can social engineer it out of a line then, sometimes not. Um, Test equipment, if you can get your hands on it, it's uh, a good thing to have. Um, there are certain T1 test equipments that you can clip onto a T1 line and actually break it out from there. So you can break down each individual channel. Um, okay. PBXs. There are two types of systems used for PBXs, and they get confused quite, a lot, quite often. There is a, what's known as a key system, which if you look at the phone, you'll have um, buttons with the actual phone numbers on them, and you can select whatever numbers on the phone. That's known as a key system. It's smaller for smaller businesses, homes, whatever. Then there's a uh, PBX, Public Branch Exchange. Basically, you pick up the line, hit line one, and it picks a line out of a pool. Those are a lot bigger, a lot more lines, um, easier to deal with. Um, the Probably the easiest way to hack a PBX would be through the voice mailbox system. Um, most mailboxes, when they're set up, are the access code to get into the PBX. This is when they're put in is either the number of the voice mailbox or all zeros. And normally, people don't make a habit of changing that. So that would probably be your easiest way to get in. And once you get in, you can change it to dial out once you get into the mailbox. Um, another thing, if you can find them, is what's known as direct trunk access codes. Basically what that is, is you dial into the switch, and you enter your code, and basically it gives you dial tone. 
Excuse me. And normally, most places have long distance restricted. Uh, it just depends on the tech who installed it. Most of the time, it's pretty default. Um, another way to get calls out of a PBX is social engineering. Um, for instance, um, calling up, getting an opera, or getting the receptionist, and asking the transfer to extension 9024. When she transfers you, it dials 9, which grabs the outside line, then dials 0, which grabs you the operator, and it truncates the last two numbers. So basically, that's one of the easier ways to get to it. <laughs> For the most part, most um, key system and PBX installation techs leave things default. I know this because I was one. Um, um, as far as, you know, your high-speed data lines, ISDN, ISDN, DSL, T1s, um, for the most part, if you try and clip onto the lines that they're on, you're not going to hear anything. Um, for certain T1s, if you clip onto the line, you'll take them down. Um, without the test equipment. Um, Nextel. Nextel actually uses uh, DMS 250s to route their traffic. Um, are there any questions? Anything I can elaborate on? I'm sorry, I'm out of it. So, yeah. Um, for the most part, when certain PBXs are set up that if a certain number of attempts are tried on the voice mailbox, it hangs up, and a lot of the systems now have caller ID included on their voice mailbox, and normally they won't let uh, any calls from that number be transferred in the voice mailbox after a certain number of attempts. trunk access numbers are either default or they're set by the tech who installed them. Most of the time they're default, which would be all zeros, one, two, three, four, five, things like that. Um, actually, it depends on the PBX. Um, some PBXs are four digits. Some PBXs are eight, and the most I've ever seen was on a Rome switch, and it was 12. for getting the password. There really isn't one that I can think of. It's, most passwords are default. Um, admin, admin, things like that. Um, once you're inside, most, most of the software on PBXs is menu driven. So it's pretty self-explanatory once you're inside. You just kind of have to cruise around a little. Yes. Uh, 
probably installed by the technician or um, administration told everybody to change their passwords that way. Probably programming in the 5ESS. Um, I'm I know that on certain lines that the payphones are on, that it's actually set in the 5ESS as a payphone class line. So some. Huh. I've never run into that. part, all the newer PBXs are being installed with uh, caller ID, so they can tell what number is being dialed and they do get logged. Um, I wouldn't really suggest it doing it from your home. <laughs> um, beige boxing would work. Um, payphones would work. Um, sometimes on certain PBXs, um, on the NEC 2000, for instance, uh, trunk number 11, if you let it ring for, I believe it's 10 times, you'll automatically pick, the uh, internal modem will automatically pick up. It's a programming feature. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> programming feature. Um, yeah, it pretty much lets you dial in, it automatically picks up. Most PBXs are installed with internal modems, usually 2400 or 2400 or 9600, sometimes 12, depending on the age. But you won't see many past 9600. Um, the Millennium payphones, the new ones with all the fancy LCD displays where you can change, you can hang up, make a new call, things like that. Um, if you dial it, if you dial one of those, and I think if it rings 14 times, it has an internal modem that picks up. And once you get inside the phone, you can actually change the amount for a local call, local call, things like that. You can change, you can change what the display reads out. You can change everything. Depends on the way the line itself is set up in the switch. Um, some of the, the switch techs kind of leave that out and let the payphones accept phone calls. I'm sorry? probably have to open up the phone to get to it. I don't think you could do it through the handset because all that's doing is picking up dial tone. Um, 
for the most part, they're, they're, they are customer owned, customer operated. Um, sometimes you'll find, like where I live, uh, Pac Bell owns them, GTE owns them. Um, and with those, those are the ones that, if you let it ring long enough, the modem picks up. Uh huh. What would be the easiest way of doing it? The easiest way of doing it. Um. Huh? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, he said if you wanted to go about acquiring a payphone, how would you do it? Well, um. My suggestion. <laughs> No, don't hijack a van. Um, my suggestion would be um, sit in a park for about a week and wait for the person to come around and actually check the payphones. He'll put his key in, open up the box, pull out the change. Um, have one of your buddies come and distract him. And nine out of 10 times, they'll leave the key in the phone. You just come up and pick it up. And then from there, once you open up the payphone, you just unbolt it from where it is. What was that? Oh, hypothetically, sorry. Now, I, I, I'm not condoning that we steal payphones or anything. This is all hypothetical. Yeah, but if you want to pay $2,500 for a payphone that's six years old. Okay. <laughs> there is also a way to acquire a booth itself. One, Very large pickup truck. <laughs> <laughs> you need a press switch and a parallel and you can unfold the, the uh, screw of the booth. Hypothetically. <laughs> No, they're actually set up, it used to be that you could, they were set up as ground start lines, which means in order to pull dial tone, ground has to be applied to the tip of the pair. And um, now they actually have a line class for payphone. So even if you were clipped on the line, you applied ground, you dialed the number, it'd still wait for the tone. The um, red box tone, uh, 25 cent deposit tone. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, he said, is that true for Pac Bell as well as Cocots? Um, for the most part, if it's a Cocot, um, the owner of the payphone just gets a ground start line and puts it up. Um, as far as the telephone company goes, they normally put it in as line class of a payphone. Yes, it's a. Um, no, I've never. I haven't had the chance to uh, hypothetically pull one apart yet. <laughs> Can you remotely rewrite the EEPROM? I've never tried. <laughs> Yes. Hypothetically, yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, when you initially connect to the Millennium Payphone, it asks um, password, and then you get in, and it's menu driven. <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha.
hypothetical default passwords. Um, Millennium. <laughs> um, actually, if you look on the phone, there's I think there's three different manufacturers. It's hypothetically a uh, abbreviation of the manufacturer's name. Um, admin. Um, password. <laughs> All zeros. <laughs> I haven't found one that says secret, but um, yeah, just your plain default passwords. Um, the password is generally six characters, four to six characters. I haven't seen any that are any longer. If you were dialing into it? Okay. Right. Um, some of the, he asked uh, if you call into a PBX, do they collect just caller ID or ANI information as well? Um, some of the older PBXs, um, a lot of your ROM switches, um, the older, bulkier PBXs, um, they don't have caller ID or ANI. They just accept the phone call. Um, some of the new ones, the NEC 2000s, 2400s, the uh, Nortel Option 11s, they have caller ID. They don't take ANI information. I'm sorry? You can star 67. Um, that doesn't always actually work. Star 67 is funny because what it's doing is it's telling that it's telling your switch that you don't want your caller ID information sent to the next switch over that you're calling, and um, it sends the information anyways. <laughs> basically, basically what um, the switch on the receiving end is doing is saying, okay, they don't want the information sent, so we won't send it any farther. Um, it, it basically, what it tells is the caller ID box to ignore this information. Yes. Yeah. When it, when the 800 number on 800 numbers, the I believe it's the phone number. I'm not sure if it's the ANI information, but that's definitely recorded and sent as part of the bill. Okay. Okay. Yes. On the newer phones. Um, I've heard, I've heard of it. I've heard of um, techs actually having to go out and plug their laptops into it to upgrade firmware or um, new releases, things like that. Yeah. Not that I know of. I don't think they download it from the 5 ESS. Um, he's asking if the older PBXs actually had um, normally DIDs, direct inward dial numbers, that basically all you could do was dial in from them. You couldn't clip on them and dial out. You wouldn't get anything. And then they had separate lines for dialing out. Um, they're not really separated. Or, I mean, they're not really connected anymore. A lot of people go with DIDs and then um, a group of maybe 10, 12 trunks to dial out, depending on the size of the company. Um, most PBXs that are being set up now, the DID number, like um, 
outside of the PBX, you'll dial a number and it'll hit an extension inside the PBX because that's the way it's supposed to route. And then they can do um, in internal PBX calls. Um, but those are simply the ID. You can't dial out from those. And then they have a, a group of trunks, usually a, a T1 to dial out on. Standardized. What would you want to tell them the receiving the payphone? Is it trying to get us to talk back to you? It's standard connection. Um, basically, when it picks up, you handshake and then it comes up with password. Is that hardware or software control? Um, I believe it's software. It's all on like one chip. I, like I said, hypothetically, I haven't taken one apart and looked at it yet. Is it all logged? Um, I'm sure it has the capability to be logged. Um, but then again, if that payphone's receiving quite a few calls a day, from different numbers, eventually it'd run out of space. Because I don't think they're putting like hard drives or anything in them to log numbers that are calling. Yes. Um, future for the video phones. Um, with she asked if there was a future in the, the video phones, video conferencing, things like that. Um, there's a company, Vivix, that's actually doing video conferencing over fiber, and it's, it's very good bandwidth. It's just you've got to have the bandwidth to be able to do it. And once fiber is to every house, then, yeah, it'll be feasible. But until then, it's still very choppy and not... Practical. Now, let's say you've already got one. You've given your password. Are there any signs or anything to look for to know that the men are coming to give you a nice bracelet to put your hand on a nice warm hood? Um, he asked if, um, once you're into one of the Millennium phones, if there was any um, indication that um, the telephone company knew that you were in there and were sending men after you. Um, as far as I know, they can only be, it's a single line, it can only be accessed one person at a time. Um, I don't really think that a telephone company would put the resources to put in multiple trunks on a single payphone line so they can monitor things like that. Yes? He's asking on um, the Millennium phones um, if something's wrong with the phone, if it actually automatically dials out to the phone company and says, hey, something's wrong. Um, yes, they do. Um, when their coin box is full, they call a computer and say, hey, I need to be emptied. Um, if there's something wrong with the line, if they can, get, if they can call, they do. Um, as far as attempts to log on to it, I don't know about that. I'm sure that's probably a feature. Do you know if there's uh, any possibility of that setting the payphone up so it call, it logs off and then calls back to mom for communication and gets another call that's Like a callback system? Like a callback system for security. Um, 
I, he's asking if there's like a callback system on the Millennium phones. If you call them up, log into them, and then disconnect, if they actually call back to their central computer and double check. Um, it's a possibility. I don't think they would, just because of if that happened, there are so many Millennium phones out there now that that would just be too much, too much resources. The uh, telephone companies try to do as much as they can with as little as possible. Yes. Laptop to a, is there any way to hook up your laptop to a payphone? Yeah, um, you can actually. There's a um, an acoustic coupler out there that connects at I think it's 26 or no, it's uh, 288. It'll connect, and you can. Uh, it's a handset coupler. That's one way to do it. Um, another way would be taking a regular phone cord, snipping the end off like you're making a beige box, putting alligator clips on it, and either putting it on the line at the B box or actually cutting through the metal sheath of the uh, handset. Hypothetically. Thank you. Yes. He's asking if there's devices that, um, when the coin box is full, uh, correct me if uh, I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. Private payphone companies. Phone companies don't do things like that. Um, on the older style payphones, they actually have a guy go out there once a week. Right. The the phone companies won't put anything like that in their phones. Um, like I said, the phone companies try to do as much as they can with as little as possible resources and manpower. Screaming. Um as far as that's concerned, um that might be something internal for like anti-redbox device, something like that. But as far as messing with the handset, messing with the keypad, things like that, um, hypothetically, I uh, know somebody who's actually demolished a phone and nothing's happened. Um, yeah, so that might be like an anti-redbox device. Yes. Okay, um, he's asking on credit card calls. You mean like on the ones where you slide your credit card in? Yeah. Um, it reads the, he's asking how the, the sequence of events goes. Um, it reads the information off the magnetic strip. Um, 
sends a dials out real quick, sends a burst of information to a computer, and then gets a reply, yes or no, based on whether or not the card is valid, things like that. Yes? Do, do the PBXs or payphones actually store credit card information that goes through there? Or numbers that are dialed, you mean? Um, I've seen certain um, external voicemail systems that are connected as a secondary thought to PBXs that will actually record what gets dialed out. And on a, on a pay, uh, PBX point of view, it usually logs all traffic going through it. Yes, you can access the logs. Yes? Um, the format for the transmission is not SS7. SS7 is simply a control protocol that um, basically says, we want to dial this number, and the responding switch says, okay, it's clear, go ahead and send the information through. Um, it's not really meant to send anything. Um, I'm not sure if the, there's any specific protocol for it. Um, as far as I know, it's just plain text, the number, the credit card number, expiration date, name, and waits for authorization. Yes. I haven't done that much research on SS7, but it's I've seen it work and it's got real flexibility, so it's a possibility. If you're in an office and you see a hardwired line, but they also have a PBX, how would you tell which one's hardwired? Is that what you're asking? Um, you probably have to trace it through the 66 blocks. Um, most of the time, though, unless it's a modem line or something that doesn't need to go through the PBX, it will. And some of the newer PBXs, you actually plug your computer into the side of the phone, and it dials out from there through the PBX. Yes. Okay. Um, the blue box was a device that duplicated the 2600 megahertz tone that was used um, to grab trunks. Um, that doesn't work anymore because it's all digital signaling through between switches. Um, red boxing uh, duplicates um, the sound that change makes when it's deposited into a payphone. Um, that doesn't really work much anymore. It depends on the switch that the line's on. If it's an older switch, I, I've heard of it working. I've never been in an area where it has worked. But I hear some of like the 1A switches, you can still red box off of, but I'm not sure. Um, the beige box is simply a phone with alligator clips on it. So it's basically a lineman's headset. Dollar version instead of 250 bucks. Um, there used to be a time where tones were sent, like, um, say you deposited money in a payphone and you're called and go through and it kept your change. You could call the operator and say, you know, I just made a call, it kept my change. And she'd send tones back down the line and 
give you your money back. Those were the green box, I believe. Yes. Yes. As far as the recording that it opens up the mic, that happens uh, where I live too, and we have five ESSs, and um, even though it opens up the mic, it doesn't accept the tones. saying that you had uh AT&T 5ESS switch, the Nortel DMS100 for long distance, or the Nortel DF DMS250 for local. Um, some of the more rural, okay. some of the more rural areas still use the older switches, uh, the 1A things like that. So that might be what it is. Jackpotting a payphone. Um, he's he's saying um, hypothetically, um, if there are any ways to rob a payphone of all its change without actually having to have the key or lock picking the the lock open. Um, basically, what happens is when you deposit your money, it slides between two contacts and creates an electrical charge. Uh, that's the, the first mechanism that actually tells that you've deposited money. And then it goes through weight and magnetics and all this and to, de to determine what kind of coin it was. Um, a piece of very thin coax or two pieces of wire, something to differentiate positive and negative. Um, I'm sure if you were to hook it up to, say, a 9-volt battery and slide it into the coin slot and play with it a little, hypothetically, of course, I've never tried this, um, you could probably get it to register that you're putting in more money than well, you are, and then it'd probably be giving you change for it. Um, yes? I'm sorry? Oh. He's, um, he's asking, there was an old trick where you could dial an 800 number, wait for them to hang up, and then get dial tone again, and dial out. Um, yes, actually, that still works on quite a few lines. 
Um, basically what's happening is when you first deposit your money and dial the number, well, for an 800 number you don't have to, but when it, when it hits the switch that you're dialing an 800 number, it opens up the line. And when they hang up and then the line resets itself, it still keeps the line open. Yes? talking about the uh, new millennium phones where they have uh, a slot for credit cards or smart cards. Um, from what I understand the way that works, um, the uh, PCS style phones where they use the, the smart cards, I know Pacific Bell uses them, um, I believe it charges the, charges the call to your account. Um, I haven't seen any actual credit cards or anything that use smart cards yet, so I'm not sure how that would go about working. Yes. He's saying that in uh, U U.S. West Turf, is it? That they sell smart cards like uh, prepaid calling cards or something similar to that? Yeah. But they basically have a dollar amount to them or? Oh, wow. Okay. Huh. I'm sorry? Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Okay. I'm out of time.